and next we have Melissa Brisbane, who, I mean, almost is, as dense and impenetrable as the legal issues surrounding surrogacy, but she's going to make that easier for you. Hi, um, my name is Melissa Brisbane, and um, I have three kids through surrogacy, and like John, I have a law firm and an agency, and we are going to talk today about a little bit in 10 minutes, we can get from a lawyer in 10 minutes, is not that much, um, about the laws and the different state laws and what you need to think about. We're going to talk today just about gestational because we really don't have enough time to talk about traditional surrogacy. But for gestational surrogacy, there are basically four legal items that we go through. Um, we go through a contract phase and getting your name on the birth certificate, either a parentage order or an adoption. That's the second. We go through insurance um, and we also go through um, escrow. So, but the first thing that you're going to do before you can do any of the legal items in your arrangement is you need to worry about the state laws, what are the different state laws, and what counts as the state law. So for instance, if you tell me you have a carrier in Massachusetts and the couple lives in New York, is it, does it matter that the couple lives in New York? Is it New York law that governs? Is it Massachusetts law that governs? What if she's going to deliver the baby in Maine? Is it Maine law that governs? So all of these choice of law issues become confusing, especially to clients who are not attorneys. So the first thing that we do is we walk through um, where, where do you want your um, gestational carrier to, to reside and give birth, and what's important to you about the birth certificate. So for instance, Israeli men who come over here as a couple only want one biological parent on the birth certificate. And some people want two men from the outset, even if they're going to be doing the second parent adoption later, they want a pre-birth order getting both of them on the birth certificate. Now there are not a whole lot of states that you can do that. Massachusetts is one of them, some areas of Pennsylvania, California, but you really need to know the state laws to know exactly where you can have two men on the birth certificate from the moment of birth when obviously one is not going to be biologically related. So we go over the state laws and what they're looking for in their birth certificate at the beginning and ultimately. Some couples don't care if within three to six months I'm going to have a birth certificate with both of our names on it and I'm going to do a second parent adoption. I don't care if my carrier delivers in Ohio and I have a single birth certificate with one man and later I'm going to do the second parent adoption in New York. So it's important for us to know that from the outset from a legal perspective. And then it's also important for us to take into account where you live. So for instance, if you have a gestational carrier who delivers in Oklahoma, you would prefer not to have a couple living in New York because it's much harder to um, do the second parent adoption and remove the carrier. So there are concerns about where you live and where the carrier lives because those laws might intersect. So that is going to be gone over with each of you individually because it's way too complicated to give you all the possible scenarios. So selecting the state law is going to be first thing that you're going to go over. So one that will come into play when you pick your carrier. Once you have your carrier, there are going to be a lot of other legal considerations that you do in the selection process. First of all, do you want a carrier who has health insurance or can get health insurance without an exclusion? And even though there are fewer of those, it certainly is possible to do that if you're on a budget because getting Lloyd's as a secondary is usually cheaper than getting it as a primary. So if you get a carrier from Pennsylvania who has Blue Cross Blue Shield, let's say, and most of the time it goes through, if you get Lloyd's as a secondary, that may, it may not work out to be cheaper, but most of the time that's going to work out to be much cheaper than getting Lloyd's as a primary. So we're going to know what are your budgetary considerations and do you want to take the carrier who has insurance into account in that process. Um, so we look at the insurance. There are, the better the state law, I find, the more likely that there will be an exclusion for a surrogate pregnancy. So for instance, you get a carrier from the state of Illinois, which has a statute on the books governing and saying that the gestational carrier cannot keep the baby if you follow certain protocols, you're going to find that almost every insurance company in the state of Illinois has an exclusion. California has a ton of gestational carriers, lots of gay men like to get their carriers from California when they know they're going to get a pre-birth order with both their names on it. As a result, insurance is much more difficult. You're going to look at getting Lloyd's as a primary, whereas if you go to the East Coast, you're much more likely to get Lloyd's as a secondary. So that comes into a fact when we take into account what's your budget, what's your risk tolerance. Um, we look at the insurance facts as well. Then you're going to have um, a contract with the carrier. This is the most important 
important point. People always ask me, is the contract enforceable? And I always say, well, what do you mean? If you find out that your carrier did not take her vitamins on Tuesday, or is that a breach of contract? Am I going to call her attorney and say, on Tuesday, you know, Susie didn't take her vitamins. We think she breached the contract. So the contract is a roadmap. It is a guide, and it's going to have a lot of things in it. But it's not going to be like building your house, whereas if 10 nails are left out, you're going to deduct the cost of the 10 nails. You know, um, so you have to you view it as it's a meeting of the minds, and it's not built to go to the courtroom. Obviously, there may be that one in 100,000 times that your, your, your contract goes to court, but it really is what do you want? Do you want her to have an abortion if the baby has Down syndrome? Up to what point will she have that abortion? Like some, some carriers might say, if there's something wrong and you find out in the first trimester, I'll do it, but after that, I'm not gonna do it. So this is a good time for you to find out what you want, because while I may be able to do certain things for you as an attorney in a contract, there are some things, certain things I can't. So for instance, if your carrier agreed to have an abortion in the first trimester and you find out the baby has Down syndrome in week 12 of the CVS test, and we approach her and we send her a note and talk to her and say, you know, John and um, Jake have decided that they do not want to continue with this pregnancy, the baby has Down syndrome, they're not comfortable, and you said you would have a termination, and we would like you know, you to undergo the termination. If she then says, I am not comfortable at this point undergoing the termination. I did not know that the heart would be bleeding. I did not fully comprehend the psychological effects it would have on me. I am not going. There would be absolute, this has never happened in our office, but, and I'm sure probably very unlikely to happen in anybody's office, but still, th there would be nothing I could do to force her to undergo that abortion because it is a constitutional right. So you would have options as a couple. And the options would be things like, I want to withhold payment. I, um, when this baby is born, I want to place it for adoption. I'm not comfortable caring for it. But if it has some connection to you biologically, that would be very difficult. So there will be certain things in the contract that are not going to be specifically enforceable. People are always shocked when I tell them this, but I say it's the same thing if I have an employment contract with my employee. If I have an assistant and I have a contract with her and I say, um, you're going to work for me for a year she walks out after two months and I say to the court well I need her to work for me those other ten months the court is not going to make her work for me the court will say you could have to pay liquidated damages because the office you know has this much money and this much time because it was out an employee but there's no slavery um, in this country so it's the same this is the same there are certain things for public policy reasons Courts do not enforce abortion, termination, reduction, amnio, CVS, anything done to your body is one of them. So you need to be very careful about that. And very sure with your match that you're very upfront with whoever is matching you. For instance, I had um, a carrier who said up front, I will not reduce a pregnancy. So you do not want um, somebody to say, I'm only going to put in two embryos. Because with IVF and blastocysts, 1% chance of splitting into identicals. So you got a one in a hundred shot that you put in those two embryos, you're getting three babies. So you have to be very careful that if you want a reduction, you don't just say, well, we're only going to put in two embryos, because that probably you know, won't work. There should be an attorney on both sides. Your carrier always needs to be represented by independent counsel. Very important. If you want her to feel comfortable with the process and the fact that she had adequate representation and that you know she went through. So if you find your carrier on your own through an agency, if it's a friend, you want to make sure she's doing it of her own free will. And generally, as part of the process, this is one of the most inexpensive. Carrier's representation is usually $1,000 or under. So um, even though that's not cheap, it is when you're spending you know, between eighty dollars and $150,000, it's certainly well worth it. I did want to say a little bit about getting your name on the birth certificate. That can be done in, in a lot of different ways. So, um, you could get a pre-birth order from the court where she's going to deliver, naming one or both of you, depending on the state laws or you could do what's called a second parent or co-parent adoption in your state of residence or sometimes where the carrier gives birth. Um, and I hope that gave you a little bit of a glimpse into the law, but if you need any more information, we'll be happy to do that later. <laughs>